busy. So, um, good morning, Christina. Happy Thanksgiving. Um, black label today because I have kids and I'm baking and I am stepping all over flour because, you know, I'm that, that nice mom that lets them play. Can I have some chocolate? Yes, hold on one second. Yeah, in your chair. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. In this episode, we're looking at the kitchen in our deep dive of the Chris Watts crime scene at 2825 Saratoga Trail. In many ways, the kitchen, certainly as far as I'm concerned, is one of the most important areas in the house, if not the most important. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's almost like three crime scenes in one. And I'll explain what I mean about that in a moment. Now, what is very important to bear in mind is even in the final photos of the children, we see them in the kitchen, we see them eating. And that raises a very critical question, which is, um, you know, is the food contents in their stomach going to give them, going to give us an indication of the time of death is it going to be able to show us that they died on um, Sunday Sunday night or um, or Monday even later than Shanann and one of the key indicators to that is food contents and so I certainly went straight to that when the autopsy results came out in any event we are going to go through various aspects in the kitchen from medication to food that was generally consumed to uh, things like things that were consumed generally like certain thrive products to alcohol and um, and then the the kitchen as a crime scene as well what, what were the contents of the trash can before we get to that i just want to um, highlight something that somebody mentioned to me directly just that you can this is just what somebody said that you can actually see there's a toothbrush in the netting of Shanann's open black suitcase and if you look carefully that could well be a kind of travel container for an electric toothbrush so anyway that is an interesting point and an interesting observation something else that sort of came up was you know that's definitely not Chris Watts in orange shirt um, the point that I kind of just want to emphasize here is he definitely changes outfits twice so certainly from the dark I think it's a dark blue um, shirt to a dark to a gray shirt and then it was just raising the possibility could he have changed it three times even because bear in mind, whatever he wore to the well site could possibly get dirty when he was digging holes and, um, you know, um, cleaning up oil or sort of just being around oil. And um, so when he returned from the well site, um, you know, would he have changed once or twice? So one thing that I'd, I did go and investigate is, is there a Conoco gas station close to Rogan and it turns out there is so in on this channel we, we kind of just want to keep an open mind about what things could mean and and talk about them and then also we want to exclude certain things uh, some people did say that that doesn't look anything like Chris Watts I think it looks a little bit like him is it's a man it's a young man it's a man with a beard and um, it's not a fat man, it's not an extremely tall man or a short man, it's approximately the same build and it was uh, CCTV, CV, CCTV footage from the area on the day at 8 o'clock in the morning. So, um, you know, uh, why not look into the possibility that it could be him? And so people who sort of at a glance say, well, that's definitely not him. Um, you know, it doesn't make sense when you're in a store and you don't want to be seen to wear a cap. Um, it also makes sense just in the sense that he went to, he defecated later at a well site if he'd eaten that morning. I'm talking about after digging, after all, that, all of that kind of thing. And um, I don't think he actually prepared breakfast 
um, when he left the crime scene or when he was at the crime scene just because he didn't have time. So you might be very dismissive and say, please give me a break. That is not him in the orange T-shirt. But then you've got to, if you're not, if you're going to dismiss that, then you've also got to say, well, where, where did he get breakfast? What did he have for breakfast? And you might say, well, he took his, the chicken nuggets he made the night before, possibly. The other side of that is that he, um, you know, he's a, a, a fit guy and a strong guy. And I think he would have quite an appetite. And, you know, I'm, I actually barbecued yesterday and I had easily eight pieces of chicken through the course of the day. And I wasn't running around that much. So I don't know, um, especially if it's kind of um, skinless chicken or something like that. Um, I can easily see him eating all four pieces in one go. So those are things kind of just worth considering, you know. Um, in this episode, we're going to really focus on the contents of the trash can in the kitchen. We're going to look at that. But we're also going to look at other things, for example, related to the kinds of food they consumed the kinds of food that were at risk to the children. And um, this promises to be quite an interesting episode. If you haven't subscribed yet to the channel, please do like, share, leave a comment. If you do share, please use the hashtag TCRS. And let's get started. So we, a lot of us are f really familiar with how we are introduced to the inside of the Watts home via the body cam. We sort of go in behind Nicole Atkinson in terms of Officer Coonrod's body cam. She's following Chris Watts. He's going to the kitchen. That's the first place he goes to. And then when, by the time Nicole and the officer gets to the kitchen, he kind of does a, a U-turn and then he sort of quickly moves by and he goes down into the basement. So it's almost like he he wants them in the kitchen so that he can sort of have a few seconds head start to do whatever he's going to do in the basement. Now, you might say, well, he just released Dieter, but it's also possible that there was something down in the basement that that, that was so important to go down there. Um, what, what is very interesting when you... Um, freeze the frames you can clearly see that there's nothing on the kitchen counters and also that the kitchen is quite pristine now bear in mind what's barbecued the night before which is a sunday night and now it's monday morning and he hasn't been home all day which means he had to have cleaned the kitchen now why would he do that why would he wash the dishes if shenan wasn't coming home why would he kind of, you know, uh, clean up the kitchen. Well, in my opinion, it's because the kitchen is part of the crime scene. And I will expand on that um, now um, in a bit more detail. So for starters, the handbag didn't, wasn't left on the kitchen counter. And some people made early errors saying, you know, I remember when I first put forward the theory that Shanann, um, uh, first of all, didn't go to bed, and secondly, was murdered within about a minute of arriving home. People said, well, why was her handbag on the kitchen counter? I think, you know, she went to the kitchen, and, and they didn't realize that, well, she didn't put her handbag on the kitchen counter. Um, and then the question is, who did? And I'm not 100% sure of the answer there. I, I can tell you that the handbag was originally in the office behind the door. There's kind of a um, a chair with other handbags on it. And um, although Nicole Atkinson talks about it, I can't quite remember if she said the handbag was on the chair or, or under the chair, but it was near the, the door. I'm also not 100% sure if she carried it to the counter. But as far as I understand, she pointed it out to the officers on scene and they then carried it to the kitchen counter and then sort of presented it to her you know okay well look inside I think after they'd photographed it and that is when she said her medication's still here and this was after the discovery of the phone so the discovery of the phone and now the, the fact that the medication 
was there was really setting off alarm bells in Nicole's mind. Um, also kind of worth noting is some of the medication that Shanann had with her. So if you look closely, if we zoom in a little bit, the that sort of capsule is, or the um, container containing the capsules is on Dancitron, and it is used to prevent nausea and vomiting, and we know that Shanann was feeling nauseous and, and vomiting. And until Chris Watts went to visit her, she seemed to be having a really good third pregnancy. So until the last day of July, she wasn't feeling nauseous or vomiting. And this is definitely an interesting area which I kind of interrogated when I wrote the book on Scott Peterson, Blood and Seawater, where you have a woman who's pregnant who is later murdered and then you have kind of symptoms. So in Lacey Peterson's case, she was extremely tired and most people would dismiss those symptoms and say, yes, because she was pregnant. And in her case, she was very close to full term. She was like eight and a half months pregnant. And so her saying she was really, really tired to, to the extent that she wasn't even walking her dog anymore. Um, people would just say, yes, well, the normal symptom of pregnancy, um, uh, move on, nothing to see her. And in Shanann's case, she was um, vomiting. Um, she was, when she left to go to Arizona on the Friday, the 10th of August, she texted her husband to say, I, I feel too weak to stand. And you might say again, I think that she was just pregnant, it's completely normal. Um, I think that is an error. I think it's possible that, that, that it was just pregnancy. But if you are a criminal and you want to, and you, you, you ultimately do murder your pregnant spouse, then doesn't it make sense to do it in a way that's going to hide the symptoms of, of the pregnancy itself with the symptoms of whatever you're doing to her? And in, in this case, that's exactly what has happened. Um, we didn't really think that much of Shanann being sick. It just seemed like symptoms of her pregnancy. And Shanann actually said that, I think it was to Christina Meacham, that she was hiding her unhappiness and her distress in terms of arguing with Chris Watts when she was in North Carolina by kind of saying that, that she was not feeling well because of her pregnancy. And so I'm just saying there's another, there's another way of where other people, people close to the victim, may be confused by what's going on, um, again, just because of the pregnancy. Um, so if you do look at, look at the symptoms of opioid overdose, they are exactly uh, the, the ones that Odansetron is used to treat, nausea, vomiting, and so on. And Shanann vomited on the day that Chris Watts arrived in North Carolina. So I think that, that is a big giveaway. She was also on Imatrix, which is migraine uh, me medication. And there's actually an incredible post where she talks about her symptoms in, in a lot of detail. Now, this is the one reason why I say the kitchen is like three crime scenes in one. Um, because in part, the, the kitchen is where the um, office art evidence artifact is, is transferred to. So the handbag, although it was in the office, gets moved to the kitchen. And so it becomes part of the ground zero of the crime scene evidence, right? Um, it's also in the kitchen where the officer uh, pulls out Hold Me Tight, a book that Shannon had ordered and thrown into the, tr and Chris Watch threw into the trash. Now, um, for those people who sort of are very attached to the idea that when Shanann arrived home, she found her husband lying in their bed and um, and then they had sex and that, that old story. Um, the, the fact that Chris Watts threw the book away clearly showed that 
he'd made up his mind where he stood with Shanann um, before she arrived home from the airport, just in that particular sense. There are some people who just don't think that there was any premeditation because he made silly mistakes. But there clearly was premeditation going on. He clearly resigned to getting rid of his family before the moment that he got rid of them. Now, of course, in the second confession, he says he doesn't know what he's thinking and he just snapped and so on. And so, of course, a lot of people simply believe that. Oh, Chris Watts said that, so that must be true. Meanwhile, how many times has he lied already? So the fact that the, this book, Hold Me Tight, is thrown in the trash, he doesn't answer love letter either. Uh, we're not quite sure where, what happened to that, but she specifically asked him to write a response, and, and obviously he, he didn't. Because who was he responding to? Kessinger. Who was he talking to? Kessinger. Who was he texting? Kessinger. Where was his thoughts for his future and, and, and his mind and... How was his body orientated to Kessinger? And what I think a lot of women don't seem to maybe, um, how can I put it, um, kind of acknowledge in a way is I think there's the sense that some men will sleep with any woman who sort of says that she's willing to have sex, right? But I think in this case, when you are very much in love with somebody, and you're very much in lust with somebody, there's almost an idea that being with somebody else is revolting, if I can put it that way. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation where you are so in love with a specific person that the idea of being with someone else is actually a um, very, very weird feeling. Um, and that includes someone that, that maybe was very close to you. You just are so, it's almost like, um, and I apologize for this metaphor, but it's almost like if you, um, you know, eat a particular kind of chocolate or confectionery that you really like, but then someone introduces you to something else that's to you much, much, much better, right? And then you start eating this other confectionery that's much better. And then now you go back to the original. You don't want to go back to the original. Um, it's, it's a bad example because no one will really object to eating chocolate. But something as intimate as sex, you don't want to get caught up in those sticky um, obligations and arrangements that arise from having sex with somebody. And what's it sort of been moving out of his marriage gradually? I'm talking about physical distance in terms of um, the one being in the one county and the other one in the one state another in the other state that kind of physical distance but even when they were in the same vicinity they, they remained a kind of f physical distance between them so the idea that there'd be this physical distance for six weeks but then on the very last day of her life watch would would give up on that that sense of trying to separate himself watch really did want a separation and he was trying to bring that about shenan didn't and Shanann did want to have sex with him, but I don't think that that even she had the opportunity or the inclination on the Monday night. Um, she was pregnant. It was two o'clock in the morning and she had to be up at five or six to take the kids to school. So would you want to? So I don't really like um, dealing with these dynamics and so on because it's a sensitive issue and you also really want to back it up within a narrative and to provide a lot of supporting um, information. And in a YouTube video, you sort of almost do it on the fly. You might have information in front of you, but it's really difficult to, in a proper way, in a detailed way, anchor it to the evidence. And I am trying to do that in these videos through photos but th there's obviously a, a heck of a lot of written information and uh, that that unfortunately makes for quite a boring video anyway we at about 20 minutes in now and i, I kind of just want to go to the kitchen itself and look at shanann standing in the kitchen and then look at what's washing dishes in the kitchen and this is another area that i've brought up uh, quite a few times and 
a lot of people have been dismissive of that as well, where I've said, I think if Shannon and Chris Watts had the same diet plan, they were eating the same way, it may have provided just a little bit of extra glue in their relationship. Um, meaning, Chris Watts got really serious about his weight loss. Um, he was not only training very hard, but he was also eating clean. And this comes up quite a few times. And that means that he would prepare his own meals and he would eat his own kind of meals. And if Shanann and the kids and him were eating the same food, that would be an opportunity for them to bond. And that includes on the very last weekend of their lives. Of course, if you're eating food separately, it's almost like when you have a smoker and a non-smoker in a situation and the non-smoker doesn't want to be in the smoking section of a restaurant and the smoker then has to go out the restaurant or whatever. And so in, all I'm saying is it breaks that sense of, of closeness. It, it, it creates a bit of a disconnection. Whereas if you, on the same plan, you're going to, it's, it's kind of, one way that you can do things together, whether it's buying food together or eating together or cooking together, whatever it is. Now, again, you might laugh at that and say, oh, that, I think that's silly. Um, let's rather talk about something else. Well, Watts and Kessinger shared the same uh, interest in healthy eating. And on the one occasion that Kessinger came to his house, whether you believe it or not, whether you believe what he's saying is true or not, his reason for her coming there was to work on a diet plan. So here you have one of the most important kind of events in terms of Kessinger coming to his house. I think it only happened twice. She comes there to talk to him about food. So you, that should give you an idea that it, that it is actually quite uh, important. So if we go through some of the social media you can see that Shanann w seemed to be quite a good um, a good cook uh, something he even said in jail was that he missed her I think he said a uh, uh, pasta or macaroni um, there are some uh, photos from the grill and bear in mind the last thing that he did on Sunday night that we know of where witnesses saw him was he barbecued outside making chicken fillets again if you think that the ch the kitchen wasn't all that important chris watts actually talks about i missed my kids throwing chicken nuggets at me which i've always found a really bizarre statement but it makes one wonder did that happen in the last weekend were they throwing chicken nuggets at him um you know in the last weekend now as far as we know he bought them cold pizza and and then fed them leftovers of the cold pizza um, kind of on Sunday but he bought them cold pizza on um, Saturday sorry not cold pizza he bought them a pizza on Saturday but um, what about Friday night so maybe the, the incident with the chicken nuggets happened on Friday I have a puppy and you know when I whenever I eat the puppy sort of wants something off my plate so it doesn't matter if I've just given the puppy his own food it doesn't matter if I've given him really nice meaty sort of canned food um, no matter what is he's been given and no matter how much he's eaten the minute I sit down he is right there at my knee and he would like kind of a handout and sometimes you've gone to quite a lo lot of effort and you've prepared something, but no, he wants something as well. And if you ignore him, he puts his, his paw on your knee and, you know, give me something kind of thing. And as much as I m love my little dog, it does kind of get a little bit annoying. Um, some dogs are less beggars than others. Schnauzers are definitely beggars, that's for sure. And it's hard to turn them down. But I want to compare that to, you know, having Choran. Um, obviously, it's not quite the same. You have an incredible duty to Choran, uh, not, not just to love them, but to, you know, be patient with them. Um, 
of course, I don't know if children will necessarily pour you if you don't give them something off your plate. It's <laughs> a little bit different. Um, and children might take a little bit longer to eat something, whereas a dog just gulps it down. But the point is, um, there are some photos on social media where you see CC taking food off Chris Watts' plate. And um, funny enough, he's wearing a shirt there, still plays with blocks, and that same shirt or a similar shirt Nicole Atkinson, Nicole Kessinger is wearing. Now, um, again, you might say, well, that's just a coincidence. Well, it could be. Yes, it could be. Or maybe she got that shirt from Chris Watts. She uh, liked it and, and then he gave it to her, something like that. So it's, it's just possible and it's worth considering. In his normal um, sort of routine when he got back from work in July, is he would get back from work um, from Anadarko, he'd work out, he'd have dinner at home but by himself. And then he would go to Kessinger. Now, it's possible he would take Dieter with him because Kessinger had a dog called Duke and maybe the dog sort of could get along. And then he would bring, when he brought himself back and the Lexus back, he would bring um, uh, Dieter with as well. This is another area that a lot of people haven't really thought about much, but I, I think it is quite important to bear in mind, was that he would just arrive home to basically work out in the basement and then, um, you know, uh, cook in the kitchen, eat, and then go to Kessinger. So he wouldn't ever sleep in his own bed. And he would um, be sort of quite familiar with the kitchen and the basement as sort of just places that he was very familiar with in the lead up to the crime. Okay, now we, I just want to move on to another area which... Um, some people may not like um, it is where Shanann put up a post in on Mar the 24th of March and I believe that is in 2018 so I, th I think this was um, a month or two before she fell pregnant and she basically wrote in that post I love my husband but he's the real reason I need black label and that's something she said quite often, um, and, and I'll, I'll put a link to the video clip that I, that I put in the beginning of this video. I'll put it um, in the description, just where you see Shanann in her kitchen. Um, you can listen to them if you like. I'll put three links in there, and you can see Shanann. But she kind of often says, I need black label for my kids to put up with some of the difficulties with you know uh, child raising and yeah she's referring to it in re with regard to her husband and then she puts up two kind of laughing fa faces and hashtag common sense and then she says i was at a grocery store and asked him to break open the pork roast and i got from costco then i told him to put the rest on a plate in the fridge and i'll freeze them tonight I come home and find not one pork roast in the oven, but two stacked on top of each other. So, um, Shanann kind of takes a photo of something that doesn't seem very clever of her husband and then puts it on Facebook and puts uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sort of face palms on on her facebook and and then there are a lot of comments and and people laughing and smiling and whatever and um then on another occasion she said two christmases ago i was baking cookies and asked him to lay the parchment paper on the cookie sheet and this is what he did he wasn't trying to be funny either and then he sees me cook all the time with another seven face palms and I don't think their marriage was doing very well at that time um, which is why they thought of the idea of having a, th a third pregnancy or having a third baby and I don't think this would have helped their marriage um, I don't know how you would feel I don't know how you would feel if the person closest to you put something on Facebook with a face palm something that you did photographing it with a face palm and then everyone chatters about 
about that. Um, some people might laugh it off, but if you're a introverted person and maybe you don't have a huge social network and your spouse has a huge network and everyone is laughing about it, I, s I know I wouldn't really like it. Um, again, you might say, so what or whatever, but ultimately this is a, a scenario where we know what happened in the end. And um, all I'm saying is, did this have an impact on Chris Watts? And I would argue that it did. Um, Shanann is totally, everyone has the, a right to say what they want to on, on social media. But I also think you one's got to look at how someone else might react, um, you know. And we know that Chris Watts had an aversion for social media. He didn't like being filmed and he just, you know, didn't really like it. And I don't think something like this would have endeared him to it very much. It's not to say it's Shanann's fault. She's, she's a, you know, um, a playful kind of person. But I think just in general, making fun of someone on social media, you've got to be careful. You've really got to be careful. Um, especially if it's someone you love and it's someone close to you. Um, we, we get a, a strange sense that, that maybe Chris Watts was trying to do the inverse where he took a photo of the doll and that was wrapped in a, um, what do you call it, a plastic mat. Was he trying to um, put that into Shanann's phone so that if someone found that they would blame her and instead it seemed to have backfired on her? In any event, if we go on to just a couple of photos of the kids sort of in the supermarket, what I want to draw your attention to is just the contents of the trolley. You can see there in the middle are two jars of peanut butter and what I want to um, just kind of illustrate is if we go to an image of CC in the pantry there on the right where above where it says goodies there is that jar. So it's right there, almost like within arm's reach. Now, um, I know this is going to cause some people to lose their, you know what, they're going to kind of just go crazy. Um, again, uh, instead of just sort of glossing over things, I think it's important just to anchor what we see in what we know and what we can know. And um, there's been a very long argument for probably the easily the past two years where people say um, that CC was allergic to peanuts, not to tree nuts. Others, or, or, or um, she wasn't even allergic to peanuts. Um, others will say that um, uh, th this is a peanut or, or a, <laughs> sorry, this is a tree nut, but that's not. So like a coconut isn't actually a tree nut or whatever, and so on and so on and so on. Um, and you might say, well, how's this relevant? Or why is this relevant? What does peanut butter in the kitchen got to do with anything? Well, it's brought up in the autopsy report that CC had a, an allergy for peanuts. And again, you will hear people saying that they'll get very upset and they'll say, you know, I know somebody who did this or whatever. This isn't about you or about somebody you know, or it's about this family. So the question is, was this particular child allergic or not? And we know that both children were quite um, vulnerable in terms of asthma, in terms of allergies and so on, and quite a few children are. And a very, very common allergy that can be deadly is peanuts. Sometimes peanuts is very People can be very, very sickened by eating peanuts, and sometimes it's something that wears off. Um, in Shanann's case, it seemed like it was peanuts and possibly tree nuts. But there's another example where it would be good to have clarity. It would be good just to know what is the actual situation. Now, we've got quite a few glimpses in the discovery for what is going on. So pistachios come up. 
um, th that she can't, Cece couldn't be exposed to uh, uh, pistachios, pistachio nuts. Um, and to the extent that it's this whole idea that if they are, there's any chance that there could be tree nuts in a, something like ice cream that CC could die, right? So it's almost like you've got to be very careful, keep things with nuts um, away. And, and you know, it's a, it's a life-threatening situation. Now, in the trash, then this is why I say it's more than one crime scene in one. So we've seen the handbag and we've seen the medication in the handbag, but there's also the um, the contents of the trash and some of the contents included the um, the bed sheet and some of the pillowcases and some of the best evidence artifacts come from um, what is on the one pillowcase. Someone said that Shanann um, urinated or something after she died. Um, I think in the discovery, it's this, the, this is referring to the February confession on February the 18th. What said that she relieved herself. Uh, I think he made a mistake in terms of his language. Um, it's not referring to just urine. I know we talk tend to talk about relieving yourself as you know you go to urinate but it but I think in this case it was both it was urine and excrement um, and um, so that is also that also comes out in the kitchen and because Chris Watt sort of vacuumed the house and picked up lots of little things um, that is in a, another packet which is put over the the trash and over the um, the bedding in the trash and so there's a good example of how what slyly leaves something some critical evidence in plain sight does that make sense so something that is um, going to get him into trouble he kind of leaves in plain sight um, it's just out of sight but it's right there and he did the same thing with his phone that he, he would leave the um, you know, he would he would commun communicate with Kessinger, but he would hide all the nude selfies on the secret calculator app. So even though that app was there, it was in plain sight, you just couldn't quite get to it. You didn't know that it was there. And you need to use the psychology to see how Watts would hide not just the execution of the crime, but also the disposal. He hid it in the plain sight of, of an average day going to work. So if we look closely at the contents of the trash can we see yellow sachets and we see a um, transparent plastic cup with a green straw in it and when the officer retrieves it it does definitely look as though it has a starbucks logo on the left hand side right and um, you can see the bed sheet in the background and that is in the kitchen and when we do a little bit of research, it turns out that that um, packaging looks like it corresponds to um, Thrive and it might be lemon meringue or anyway, some kind of powder that um, might have a lemon meringue sort of flavor. But if you go to the ingredients and some people may now argue, well, this wasn't a Thrive bar, it was a Thrive sachet or something. It doesn't really matter. The point is that you have these ingredients in Thrive products. And they, they include allergens. It's specifically um, categorized as an allergen, which is a warning, uh, and that it contains tree nuts. And it specifically says tree nuts and even more specifically that it's coconut now on the Saturday night when McKenna Lindstrom was babysitting the watch children Bella couldn't sleep and she couldn't sleep because she said she was worried that her sister when she went to sleep her sister wouldn't wake up and in particular she was worried about 
her eating coconuts. Now you can search through the, the discovery and you won't find any references to coconuts because that comes up verbally in the interview with McKenna Lindstrom by CBI agent Kevin Kobach and it's obviously an error or an oversight that he just doesn't uh, make a note of that even though that was really important because it has a bearing on Nutgate, right? Now, um, the point that we simply want to highlight here is um, Cindy Watts got into trouble for giving out ice cream that may have had nuts in it. Um, the products that Shanann was selling ordinarily, it looks like they contained allergens as well and they were ordinarily in the house. Besides that, there was also peanut butter that they kept in the house. Now, my personal view isn't, it's, it's, it's not um, whether CC had a peanut allergy or a tree nut allergy. Uh, my personal view is that I don't think Nutgate really had anything to do with nuts. I think Nutgate had to do with feelings of enmity between a wife and her mother-in-law and maybe vice versa as well. I think the nut thing was just um, something that happened to cause an explosion, but I don't think it was really about nuts. So Nutgate wasn't about nuts. And I, I think the fact that there's so much confusion about was it tree nuts or peanuts and this and that, I think it, it kind of illustrates that. I do think that if you, again, compared to what I said about pregnancy, if you can hide the symptoms that are going to be responsible for um, weakening someone and perhaps even killing them with the symptoms of pregnancy in a situation where CC was supposedly almost killed because of tree nuts, the thought had to have entered Watts' mind. Well, isn't there a way that that one could do that? Um, in other words, if that is a way to kill a child by accident, well, then why not purposefully? And you could either claim it was an accident or if it was such an effective killer, if, if something like tree nuts was such an effective killer, why not use some sort of chemical to, to do that? Given that that is what he wanted to do, he did want to do away with his children. And that brings up the sort of third area where I think the kitchen was a crime scene but in this sense it was not a crime scene via almost like an indirect sense like in terms of the the bedding it's the kitchen as a crime scene but via the bedroom um, in terms of the handbag it's the kitchen as a crime scene but via the office but in terms of the um, what I'm going to talk about now um, I, I kind of see the kitchen as a crime scene in terms of itself and what I mean by this is I believe that a concoction was made in the kitchen, possibly during dinner time, where um, something was prepared to um, overdose the children, because the kitchen was the natural place to prepare meals, to make shakes, to where you're going to get things like milk and uh, water, for example, also where you could wash up the evidence. Um, if something like oxycodone was retrieved from the basement and then ground down in, in a really big dose, bear in mind an adult might be able to handle a certain kind of dose but a child wouldn't. I know what the counter argument to that is, is that well if they were given a dose why didn't it come up in the autopsies? Um, I talk about that in my books um, and I'm not going to deal with that here because we're not talking about that we're dealing with the kitchen now, not what is going on at the well site. What I will say is in the autopsies, no food contents were found. There was just a small amount of, um, I think, greenish colored substance in Bella's stomach, as far as I remember. And um, it's it not clear to me if that was a little bit of oil or something else. But peop a lot of people also said that uh, the children drowned in oil because one of them had swallowed oil. Swallowed oil, not... There was absolutely no oil in their lungs. So th that's another area where some people 
opportunistically try to make the shocking claim that the, the children were dumped alive into the oil tanks and it makes for riveting YouTube viewing but it, of course it makes no sense why anyone would do that um, to their own children. Um, you might think that Watts is this huge monster and he wanted his children to suffer. I don't think he did. He, he was just trying to um, remove the obstacles between himself and his mistress and no one is saying that um, what he was doing was justified just that is what he was trying to do and I don't think he was trying to cause anyone extra suffering Shanann's death as horrible as it was I don't think he punched her or tried to hurt her in terms of like knocking her around he simply wanted her out of the way he wanted to be with his mistress and and I think people miss that um, that doesn't make the crime any less bad than it than it was but we should also be clear you know it's not like it's not the same thing as what Patrick Frazee did to his fiance where he bludgeoned her to death with a baseball bat it's a different kind of crime it's a quieter more stealthy crime if that makes sense in the Chris Watts case, not a drop of blood was actually shed in the committing of these crimes. And you would ask, how is that possible? And one of the ways you do that is uh, you look at what is right in front of you. And what, what do we see in Shanann's social media? We see that it is part of her routine and to some extent the routine of the children and even Chris Watts' routine that they would go everywhere with kind of like a, like a flask. Where they were a shake and Shanann in particular would have a shake every single day and you also see her with a shake at the airport on the way to Arizona and that was when she said she texted him early in the morning saying I feel too weak to stand and he, and he responded maybe it's from lack of sleep it wasn't from lack of sleep it was more than likely the contents of her shake and that's something that if I was an investigator or a detective I would have said can we account for all the shakes? I'm talking about the those containers. Or were two or three of them missing? Because that's not found in the trash. Um, it's possible that the Starbucks coffee cup had was used to... Um, you know, something had been put in there. I just don't think so. So to me, it's more the, the evidence of the sachets might show that that is what the children had to drink, a, a, a Thrive Shake, or what Shanann had to drink before she went to, uh, what Shanann had to drink when she flew to Arizona, maybe what made that shake for her. What's it quite a lot around the house, so it would be normal that he would um, make shakes for her, make shakes for himself, and prepare meals for the children and so that would be the ideal opportunity to sneak something um, poisonous potentially lethal into somebody's food right if the kitchen was the crime scene and the children sort of watched television on their little mini couches while they were drinking or eating something or whether that was a sort of a dessert that, that they had. And Chris Watts actually laughed during the sermon on the porch saying, you're not going to get your dessert if you don't do that. And then he sort of laughed. I think that may play into what, what has really happened. In any event, if they did expire in the lounge on their, on their mini couches, um, I, I would imagine he wouldn't want to uh, have spoken to Kessinger in the lounge you wouldn't want to be thinking about that or reminded of that and more likely it would be in the loft couch loft lounge with the television on there and of course he he wouldn't have thought about Kessinger thinking well why is the television on late on a um on a sunday night like how should wouldn't it be disturbing your children and so that's that's one clear indicator that they were already dead by then the children Another one that you won't hear YouTubers mention too often is Shanann actually said to her husband, can you please send me pictures of the kids in bed? In bed, literally. And it was at the time that they should have been in bed. And then he didn't. And I would argue he didn't because he couldn't. 
Um, he didn't just not respond to her. So you could say, well, he was just too busy or he was um, indisposed or something. He did actually send her pictures. He just resent pictures he'd sent early in the day. And all the pictures he sent were of the kids eating. Two of them were in the kitchen and one of them was of Bella at the kids' birthday party um, opening like a packet of something. Once again, it makes you wonder what was their last meal and why was there nothing in their stomach contents? Well, one possibility is, I mean, even if he fed them cold pizza, if he knew they weren't going to have a last meal, let alone breakfast, then it wasn't necessary to make them a meal if he knew that was going to be their last moments, if I can put it that way. Also, he could have combined the last meal with whatever's going to poison them. And that is what I believe happened. And I believe that happened while he was barbecuing um, the chicken. Um, he'd already given them this sedative, essentially, so that that would calm them down and put them to sleep. Um, because he didn't he didn't intend to pack their school bags. He didn't intend to put them to bed. And he did say somewhere in the interrogation um, uh, that that was the last time, I knew that was the last time I would ever put them to bed. And you might actually think he didn't really want to. He didn't really, he was tired of putting them to bed because think about that just in terms of when he was in North Carolina. He's away from Kessinger. He wants to talk to her. But he can't talk to her when he's obligated to bathe his children, feed his children. And all of that is a tends to be a long, excruciatingly long, drawn-out process. Sometimes it takes a long time to feed children and also put them into bed. And if you want to be somewhere else, it's a very excruciating business. And the problem was what was being torn in two. He was torn between being a husband and a father and a father-to-be and a lover and you know his own man with somebody else all right i'm not going to take it further than that the next episode in the deep dives will be the sort of lounge area and staircase and that'll be the last sort of free episode on youtube from then on i'll put up a preview uh, I, i'm going to do the basement after that in kind of a little bit more detail then the garage and driveway in some detail, and then survey 319. So there'll basically be three free episodes on YouTube and three on Patreon, which uh, will cost you a dollar to watch. These are very labor-intensive episodes. It takes a really long time to source the images, to sync them to the audio, um, and to get everything together. My patrons also feeling a little shortchanged. I promised them quite a lot of content, and in this time and I've had to delay uh, narrating audiobooks and uh, I need to get kind of get back to that so um, I have put some stuff up here I will be doing some uh, narration uh, sort of walk through of the, the narratives of some of the officers on the scene I've already done Coonrod I need to complete that I need also need to do officer James and so on so after the third episode dealing with the lounge and staircase, I will be doing Officer James. So look out for that. If you're interested in uh, catching that and you haven't subscribed yet, please do. If you're finding this interesting, please tell other people about it. Like, share, leave a comment. Uh, if you do share, use the hashtag TCRS. And I'll see you guys next time.